So if you support a clean and a green uh, and a sustainable energy future, you support Bitcoin mining because Bitcoin mining is helping achieve that goal. As we dive into the second quarter of 2024, Bitcoin is moving forward, Bitcoin mining is moving forward, and the blockchain-backed ecosystem is evolving at a rapid pace. And that is why it is great to have on my guest today, Perry Ann Boring, who is the CEO and founder of the Digital Chamber. Perry Ann, how are you doing? Hey, Jared, it's good to be here. It's great to be here. Thank you for taking the time. Before we dive into maybe what's going on now and we talk about your event in DC, which is coming up quickly, could you give us a quick little background on what the Digital Chamber is? We are a, a nonprofit uh, trade association. We represent companies that are building, investing, and innovating in the digital asset, Bitcoin and blockchain technology space. Uh, we're here to bring this technology to the people of the world. We're big believers. We think this technology is going to solve so many issues that we have in our financial system, the digital economy, the um, the, the monetary system, and we want everybody to have access to it. So we're headquartered in Washington, D.C., and a big focus of ours is in the public policy space. We've, we work very closely with uh, members of Congress, the administration, with regulators, lawmakers, policymakers uh, to support them and developing a legal environment that encourages the development and investment of this technology. Excellent. And in doing some homework, I know that you started your career on Capitol Hill and you were working in and around the finance committee and then you kind of fell into Bitcoin. And now we fast forward all the way and this is the 10th year that, of the chamber. You guys were founded, I believe, in 2014. So first of all, yeah. congrats. It feels like Thank things are you. just moving really, really quickly. Now we're in a post Bitcoin ETF environment and I just am curious how that changes things. Because for me, when I think in 10 years in the future, in 10 years now, you know, the chamber is in its 20th year and we look back, for me, it's gonna probably feel like, and I wanna ask if it's for you as well, there was a post or there was a pre and there was a post Bitcoin ETF, just as far as overall environment and maybe thinking around blockchain backed assets, obviously led by Bitcoin. Have things changed? Have they not? Uh, it depends on what we're talking about. From the, the market side, absolutely, because having spot Bitcoin ETFs is bringing in more institutional inflows into the Bitcoin markets. So that's absolutely a net positive. From the policy and the regulatory environment, uh, not so much. I mean, we still have an extremely hostile administration who does not believe we have a right as an industry to exist. They're trying to ban access to this technology. And if you read the day that the spot Bitcoin ETFs launched, if you read SEC Chairman Gettler's statement, he you know, he essentially said, I was forced to do this because I lost a lawsuit, but I still don't want to. And he went kicking and screaming down to the last minute, did not want to allow uh, people to have access to spot Bitcoin ETFs. Uh, and enforcement actions haven't slowed down. The arbitrary and capricious uh, strategy of the SEC has not really changed. Um, so the, we're, we're in an extremely um, intense uh, environment, at least with the, the U.S. federal government, and this hasn't really slowed that down at all. Uh, but I think in uh, but I think, you know, having access to spot Bitcoin ETFs is absolutely critical for the markets. It's bringing institutional inflows in. It also allows for a new, very safe option for retail investors to allocate to this new and different asset class of Bitcoin. But we still have a lot of issues to work out on the legal and the policy side. That was a great answer, because I think that there are two things, right? There's the market sentiment and all the financial products that you can now invest to get to get access to Bitcoin. And then there is the policy side. And the policy side, one of the things I think you just alluded to, and I wanna to touch a little bit further on, is the digital asset money laundering, or what I believe you are referring to as the DAML, and what that would mean for the industry, because that seems to be a way to, it's almost like, you know, if your grandma takes you to a pool and is like, we're gonna to go to the pool today, uh, but you can't get wet or something like that. So it's like, you can't really go swimming because of that rule. And I know that that affects how people are going to be able to hold the digital assets, right? If you can't self custody, does that, you know, impact the entire ecosystem? And I say this from a Bitcoin mining standpoint too, where many people who connect to pools, they then get paid out in self custody wallets. So that is something that definitely may impact Bitcoin mining, but 
overall, is that one of the things as far as a policy that is still a little bit not as friendly? Oh, this is the the worst piece of legislation that's ever been introduced in the U.S. Congress. It's a flagrant violation of many constitutional rights uh, and would it's, it's essentially a backdoor ban. And that's what we're calling it. We're calling it the, the crypto ban. Uh, this is S2669, the Digital Asset Anti-Money Laundering Act. It's sponsored by Elizabeth Warren. The lead uh, Republican sponsor is Roger Marshall. So it was introduced in a bipartisan way with Roger Marshall and Elizabeth Warren. It has 19 co-sponsors in total. So roughly 20% of the U.S. Senate supports and is on record of we should completely restrict access to this technology. Um, I'll tell you exactly what it does, because uh, if you read the legislation, it doesn't say we're banning cryptocurrency. You got to you got to kind of be able to read between the lines here a little bit. What it does is it defines some core things in the blockchain space. It defines um, Bitcoin mining. Uh, or proof of work mining, it defines node validating, it defines unhosted wallets, as well as a, a, a several other things. But those are the kind of the top three that I think are the most egregious. So it defines them. And then it says these are subjected, these functions, these en these entities that do this are, are considered financial institutions and subjected to the Bank Secrecy Act. So what does that mean? That means a self-hosted wallet which can just be a piece of open source software code, a Bitcoin mining company, anyone running or validating any kind of blockchain would have to collect the personal identifiable information of the transactions associated with um, the transactions being mined or validated or uh, th through a self-hosted wallet, through self-custody how you would do this with a self-hosted wallet I ha it makes absolutely no sense to me at all. I, I don't, I, it seems completely impossible to do. Obviously, if you're a Bitcoin miner, you don't have the social security number or the name or the address of the people associated with the transactions that you're validating. This information does not exist. So you have no way to comply, which means you could not operate. You could not mine Bitcoin legally. You couldn't verify or provide no validation services for any type of blockchain legally in the United States. So let's just call it what it is. This is a ban and it would be detrimental to our space. And it has significant support and it's moving through the legislative process. There's been three hearings on this bill in the Senate. Sean Kasson's in the House is currently working to introduce companion legislation. This is exactly what I mean by we're facing very significant attacks. Uh, and it is critical that the industry uh, participates in the political process because politicians are working to restrict our access to open source technologies, uh, which is a, a fragrant, fr fragrant violation of our constitutional rights. One of the biggest FUD narratives I think that I run into when I talk about Bitcoin or Bitcoin mining is that people immediately tie it to crime and they immediately tie it to illicit activity. And one of the things I saw on the Digital Chambers website is you have a quote from the Chain Analysis Crypto Crime Report from 2022. And I'd like to read that out loud because I think it's important. It says, money laundering accounted for just 0.05% of all cryptocurrency transaction volume in 2021. For comparison, the UN Office of Drugs and Crime estimates that between 800 billion and two trillion of fiat currency is laundered each year, as much as 5% of global GDP. That is orders in magnitude more that is used in fiat. And so when you are sitting down with lawmakers and people from your team are talking to leaders on Capitol Hill, how are you approaching this particular subject around money laundering and crime and illicit activity being used on the blockchain? Yeah, I mean, it, it really started back with Silk Road in uh, 2013, when the Silk Road, this multi-billion dollar marketplace where people were buying and selling illegal drugs was taken down. Of course, uh, Ross was sentenced to life in prison. He's still there today for, for, for this. And that's really where that narrative perpetuated, where it started from. And we, we started the chamber in 2014. So really right after that happened, that was one of the reasons why we started the digital chamber is because what was all over the news and what uh, the media would have led you to believe is that um, Bitcoin is the currency of choice for criminals. It's the only thing it's good for. That's all it's used for. That's all it has the potential to be. So we must stop it. That was the conversation in 2013 and, and 2014. Uh, Ten, it's been 10 years, 
and we have 10 years of data, if not more, there, Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies are not the currency of choice for illicit finance for criminals. This is probably the dumbest thing you could possibly do if you're trying to conceal your transactions would be to put a trail, uh, you know, a, a, a paper trail, a money trail on a public unalterable ledger. I mean, it just makes absolutely no sense. Even law enforcement is coming out and, and, and saying that quite directly. Of, no, we don't have an illicit finance issue in the cryptocurrency space. Um, Jared, I know your audience knows well how chain analysis works. Of course, every single transaction on the Bitcoin blockchain is logged on a public ledger. And so law enforcement can trace that and uh, and they are, and they're using this um, uh, capability to trace and track and follow the flow of monies. This led to many um, uh, it, it, law enforcement has been able to use that to apprehend criminals. There's been many, many cases where this technology has been used to solve the issue, identify the perpetrator and bring them to justice. A lot of very successful um, cases have, um, you know, blockchain has been a part of assisting the law enforcement efforts to do just that. Um, and that's really our message to to, to policymakers. And uh, if Pretty much everybody except Elizabeth Warren's office has been willing to listen for about three and a half minutes and then come to the conclusion, oh, yeah, that doesn't make any sense that we don't have an illicit finance issue. And, and, and the numbers uh, prove that as well, which is why I'm saying these attacks on our industry, these are political attacks. They're not rooted in education. They're not rooted in data. They're not rooted in logic or common sense. It, these are just these are political goals that's being um, uh, carried out that I think are going to be extremely harmful to our national security here at the United States. So crypto does not have an AML problem. Don't let anyone tell you that. And if they do, you can quote that, that, that study that you shared, Jared. Absolutely. You just talked about the politics of policy. And I think that that's a really interesting thing because narratives are often based on perception rather than reality. And the perception is that maybe it has to do with crime or blockchain or crypto or Bitcoin has to do with crime. The reality of it is we know it doesn't. The data tells us differently. And so looking at policies that are coming up, you had mentioned one right before we hopped on recording that we should probably dive into SAB 121. Do you want to speak a little bit about that? Yeah, so SAB 121, or the Staff Accounting Bulletin, is the SEC's uh, Staff Accounting Bulletin 121. This is a, a rule regulations imposed by the SEC, um, primarily on banks, uh, that says if you're going to custody uh, Bitcoin or any type of digital asset, you have to hold uh, equal reserves in um, what they deem you know, a safe asset like cash, US dollars. So in other words, it's putting a 200% reserve requirement on banks. And this has proven to um, prevent you know, the largest, most regulated financial institutions in the world from being able to provide custody services of digital assets. Uh, we do believe that the banking system has a role to play in helping bring this technology to the world. We believe everyone should have the opportunity to, to build, to invest, to innovate on blockchains. That includes banks, that includes non-banks. This rule prevents banks from being able to do that. So we've come out very strongly against it. Um, and we helped uh, support an investigation done by the Government Accountability Office that found that these rules were improper. They violate the Administrative Procedures Act. Shocker, the, it's not the first time the SEC has done this. Uh, and so Congress has an opportunity to knock them down. They can nullify it. So uh, a bill was introduced in both the House and the Senate to nullify this rule. Uh, it passed through the House Financial Services Committee earlier this year, and it is um, scheduled to be voted on by on the House floor this week, and it is expected to pass. Uh, so this is a really important um, bill to help uh, make this technology more accessible to different constituencies of users and investors. It still needs to pass through the, the Senate. Uh, Senator um, Cynthia Lummis is spearheading that effort, and she's uh, ready to go to bring this through the Senate. It does have to pass, or it does have to be signed by the president as well. Uh, but uh, we're extremely excited that 
um, when it passed out of the House Financial Services Committee, three Democrats voted in favor for it. Um, so it has bipartisan support, and uh, we believe um, it'll be successful in um, being fully repealed. Each one of these policies that you and the chamber are able to support and kind of protect the blockchain ecosystem, I feel like is like a battle amongst a war that's going to probably go on for a long time until this finally you know, sets in in policy and is a part of the United States' national and energy security. And I've heard you speak in the past, and those are two things that I think people on either side of the aisle are going to probably have to agree with, that if we can improve our national security and our energy security, this is probably a net positive for the United States and what we're trying to do moving forward. And with that, I'd love to hear you talk about the digital power network and how Bitcoin mining does play a role in both of those things in national security and in energy security. Yeah, absolutely. We've worked with uh, many different um, Bitcoin mining companies over a number of years. And today we represent over 50 percent of the hash power that's being generated in the United States. So we sit in a really uh, privileged uh, position at the Digital Chamber where we get to work with so many different companies, really the entire ecosystem. So we have the opportunity to see how the whole ecosystem works together and how it comes together. And in energy, in energy markets is extremely interesting. There are uh, Bitcoin mining and Bitcoin technology companies that are mining Bitcoin and becoming integrated with energy infrastructure in a number of different ways. And we see four different themes of how the Bitcoin mining industry is advancing domestic energy security. And those uh, four pillars are through methane mitigation. So literally preventing harmful emissions from going into the environment by using Bitcoin mining tools. Uh, two is uh, increasing the uh, uh, blueprint of renewables. So, you know, uh, we have Bitcoin mining, as you probably know, has the highest uh, sustainability energy mix out of any industry. Uh, you know, upwards of 60% of all Bitcoin mined today is used using uh, clean or sustainable energy sources like wind and solar. Bitcoin mining companies are... Uh, uh, supporting the the build out and the investment of renewables. So if you support a clean and a green uh, and a sustainable energy future, you support Bitcoin mining because Bitcoin mining is helping achieve that goal. Um, the third is through grid stabilization. I think many of us have uh, have seen and heard uh, all about these Bitcoin mining companies. Um, largely in Texas is where a lot of the news is happening, but it's all around the country. Uh, where Bitcoin mining companies are partnered with the grid operators to help stabilize the grid uh, because they have a flexible load, they can turn off at, at peak demand, and they're helping prevent blackouts and stabilize the energy grid, which has tremendous value to energy markets. Uh, and then the fourth is through um, is, is a national security issue of chip manufacturing. Uh, there are millions of semiconductors that are deployed today across the United States that are mining Bitcoin. Uh, and the Bitcoin mining industry is investing heavily in semiconductors. And that has led to the introduction of a, uh, of a U.S. company that's building U.S. semiconductors um, and working to bring the semiconductor industry here, uh, national security goal to be able to fabricate chips here in the United States. Bitcoin mining help, is helping drive that demand to reach that goal. Uh, so when you take all of these different activities and the different ways that Bitcoin mining companies are um, involved in energy markets, I, I believe we can present a comprehensive case to policymakers that says Bitcoin mining is advancing energy security. And once we win that argument, we have now won a national security argument because energy security is national security. Uh, and now we have new advocates for Bitcoin. When you have traditional energy stakeholders that are saying, yes, this is helping secure and protect and um, uh, secure um, energy um, en energy infrastructure, we've achieved a national security goal as an industry. And I think that is going to trump all this other disinformation and political stuff that we're seeing on the political fronts because everybody takes national security seriously. No, we don't play politics with national security. Absolutely love that. And those are four simple things that I think, as you've just said, no one plays with national security. If energy security is national security and Bitcoin can bring energy security, then it's Bitcoin mining is national security. 
I wanted to share with you something that you said back in 2017 about blockchain and then ask if you still feel like it holds true and will it hold true into the future. So you said in 2017 in a video that I found and it was blockchain in us, you said in 10 or 20 years time, there won't be a human whose life isn't impacted by this technology. Where are we? Cause you said that in 2017. So then by 2027, is it, are, are we, are we speeding up that timeline? Is it slowing down? And how do you think actually U S policy is going to impact that timeline based on the fact that the U S leads the way in technology and many things in the world. And many countries look to see what the U S is going to do from a policy standpoint. I, I do think that everyone is going to be impacted by the, the tech, uh, by blockchain technology, Bitcoin, d digital assets, and it'll take many different forms. Uh, for one, uh, I believe that all assets, tangible and intangible, will be tokenized and represented on a blockchain. So Bitcoin is obviously the first bear instrument, the first digital bear instrument, the first cryptocurrency, the first true digital asset. Um, but there will be assets of all kinds that are tracked and traced on the blockchain. Blockchains are, are will soon be considered critical digital infrastructure because it's what we're going to use to transact and interact in the digital economy. Uh, Bitcoin serves an extremely important role in in the in in the digital economy and the economy overall. It's 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 a store of value. It's digital gold. Um, there's uh, so much need for that today. Uh, here in the United States, one of the top complaints, one of the number one issues for American voters, is inflation. Uh, in you know, in 2024, so many people are struggling to keep up, are struggling to uh, pay their rent, to buy groceries, to buy gas, childcare, you know, all the things it takes just to survive. And we're one of the first generations that feel like we won't have the same op opportunities as our parents. And it's because it's because the money system is broke. It's because of inflation. And I believe that Bitcoin serves in, in, as an extremely important tool for people to be able to protect their purchasing power, especially in a high inflation environment. So there's a whole host of people who are already choosing to diversify into Bitcoin to protect their wealth. It's not just people. It's also corporations. Um, uh, Michael Saylor's uh, micro strategy being really the first to spearhead that strategy. But many other corporations will follow suit. Um, this, you know, the idea of real world assets of all assets uh, being represented on a blockchain, that's something that's going to take um, probably a little bit more time, but we're already seeing a lot of experimentation and innovation uh, there. And then kind of the third area where I see blockchain technologies are going to penetrate the digital economy is through stable coins. Uh, we already have hundreds of billions, if not trillions of dollars worth of stable coins. These are U.S. dollar coins operating today. Uh, there is a huge demand for U.S. dollar, despite the fact that we're in an extremely high inflationary period today. Um, the the, the do cash is, you know, the, the dollar is still dominant. It's still the world reserve currency, and there's many emerging nations around the world uh, where having access to the dollar is extremely favorable, and there's a lot of demand for it. Uh, if we can make dollars more accessible to more people around the world, particularly in emerging nations. Um, we will be able to extend uh, the dollar's dominance. And that's that is the promise of stable coins. Um, so I, I I truly believe that this technology is just as important as the internet itself, if not more. The internet was created to allow us to communicate in a digital peer-to-peer -peer way. Blockchains or web 3.0 allow us to transact in a digital peer-to-peer -peer way. It's the internet of value. Uh, and that uh, is going to have so many different applications and use cases uh, that is going to transform many different industries, just like the internet itself did. Couldn't agree more. I live most of the year in South America and people here to protect purchasing power are trying to get digital dollars or stable coins or Bitcoin if it's going to be a long term hold. So from a financial standpoint, blockchain is huge for the overall global economy. This episode will be out on May 8th. And on May 15th, just basically a week after, you have a massive event in D.C. So I'd love for you to talk more about that event, maybe shout out some speakers and kind of what you hope to get from the event as the chamber and then what you hope your participants to be able to get. There will be lawmakers and all type of different change makers from Capitol Hill. 
Yeah, thanks, Jared. Uh, on May 15th, we are hosting the DC Blockchain Summit. This is one of the original blockchain events in the world. We've been holding this since 2016. It's the largest in the nation's capital. We have over 100 speakers. Uh, we have uh, people from the industry as well as uh, policymakers coming uh, to, to talk about uh, just that, the innovations across the digital asset space. Uh, so we have many companies that are going to come and share new product announcements, uh, how they're impacting communities around the world. I felt strongly that the industry needed its own platform in the nation's capital because so many times when we talk about Bitcoin or crypto or blockchain, it's on the regulator's turf. And so many times they're coming at it from a regulator's point of view, which is let's identify anything that's bad and figure out how to, how to regulate it. Um, so it's not always the most positive conversation. And we felt like that was really missing in Washington. So we wanted to give the industry its own platform where we can come and share about how this technology is uh, is improving different communities and exactly how they're doing that. And then we also have a number of policymakers and regulators that will come to make their own speeches and statements. So there'll be a lot of policy talk, a lot of industry talk. Uh, and together we'll be talking about how we can shape the future. That's our theme is shaping the future uh, and how blockchain is, you know, is, is going to be a critical technology and how, you know, how blockchains are becoming um, critical digital infrastructure. So we have uh Federal Reserve Governor Michelle Bowman coming. We have uh, Crypto Mom, uh, aka Hester Purse, uh, SEC Commissioner. We have CFTC Commissioner Caroline Pham coming. We have Senator Bud, Senator Nick, uh, Congressman Nickel. Uh, we've got uh, many different uh, CEOs from the Bitcoin mining space. Fred Thiel, the CEO of Marathon. Jason Lutz, the CEO of Riot, will all be there. Uh, so it's a uh, don't miss the opportunity to come. You can uh, check it out at dcblockchainsummit.com. Perfect. And also, I'd love to give you a moment to shout out where people can learn more about the Digital Chamber, donate as you are 501c3 and follow where I believe you guys are on LinkedIn and X, but where are the best places where people can kind of follow up and learn more? You can check out our website at digitalchamber.org. And then we're also very active on uh, on X or Twitter at Digital Chamber. Uh, and my Twitter handle or my X handle is Perryann DC, as in Washington DC, Perryann DC. Um, we're a 501c6, but we also have a foundation, a C3. We do accept general donations uh, from the public and you can use those uh, to offset your capital gains taxes like any other C3. And that goes to our education efforts are organized through our C3 and then our C6 is doing all the advocacy work. Perianne, this has been a great conversation. I unfortunately won't be able to make it up to DC for May 15th for the event, but I hope to see you in uh, Nashville. I assume that you will be there. For I will Bitcoin be there Nashville. as well. Wouldn't miss it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, Perian, thank you for taking the time uh, for hopping on. For everyone watching or listening, go ahead and subscribe to the podcast, either on the podcast platform or on YouTube. You can follow us on X, Twitter, as we still say, LinkedIn and YouTube. Perian, thank you once again for joining. And yeah, I'll see you in Nashville. So good to be here. Thanks, Jared.